Shalom, and welcome everyone to another episode of Keys of the Kingdom. I am your host, Tony Pino, and in today's episode, we're getting uh, back to the Galatian series that Mr. Solberg is trying to do. Uh, he has a ministry called Defending the Biblical Roots of Christianity, and he is going through the book of Galatians here. So we are walking through his arguments on what he feels the book of Galatians is expressing. And of course, I am showing you that he's not arguing the argument of Paul. Paul is not anti-law of Moshe. He does not teach that you don't have to follow the law of Moshe as a follower of Yeshua. He is preaching against the customs and traditions of the Judaisms of the day that said that you must convert to becoming a Jew to be saved. Through their customs and traditions, they had a proselytized system converting Gentiles to becoming Jews according to their traditions. And that technical term was works of law at that time. And yes, that was going against the gospel message because that is not found in the law of Moshe. All right. And Mr. Solberg will try and make it seem like there's a contradiction between having faith and following the law. Okay. There is no contradiction. Okay. When you have faith in Yahweh, you will follow the law. That was what it was um, shown at Mount Sinai. Their faith and trust in Yahweh brought them to Sinai, where they were introduced to the law, and they were commanded to do the law, the law of Moshe. So being commanded to do the law of Moshe is not going to be in contradiction of faith, okay? Your faith is going to be expressed by your what? Walk in obedience to the law, which includes repentance, which includes walking in repentance, because walking in the law is showing the character of Yahweh, how to love people, how to love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, how to walk in the image of Yahweh. These are divine laws. These are not uh, man-made laws. And so in the book of Galatians, Paul is against the man-made traditions because they cause you to violate the law of Moshe, the covenant that was given. And Mr. Solberg is just not recognizing that. He is arguing an argument that Paul does not have. So what I want to do as we're getting now into video number three, last time together we were introduced to that technical term works of law. So I'm going to show you a couple resources that will help point you to the fact that it doesn't mean the law of Moshe as a general observance or someone trying to earn their salvation uh, by keeping the law. No, it was a technical term meaning customs and traditions within that community. And I'll get more into that here in just a moment. But if you find that you like this video, want to know more about what I teach, just hit the subscribe button on the right-hand side. It takes you to my YouTube channel where you'll find many other videos like this one on many other topics. All right, go ahead and hit the like button, hit the comment button and leave me a comment. I greatly uh, appreciate that. I'd love to hear from you. Pass the videos around if you feel that will help others. All right. But yeah, I want to get into some of the sources that I uh, have in the description box here to begin before we get into video number three, just so you can see a little bit more of where I'm coming from and the sources that I use. And of course, these sources, again, will be in the description box. You will also find me on Spotify. Okay, I'll have the link to that uh, Keys of the Kingdom connected to uh, Spotify where you can find me. All right, let's go ahead and get into some of these sources, then we'll get into video number three. All right, a Messianic apologist named J.K. McKee uh, has an article here that I often use called Works of the Law. And you can see here by the title, a question was asked. It says, I have heard a teaching which stated that the term works of the law actually refers to rabbinical extra biblical commands is there any substantiation for this and mr mckee will go on to show that there is especially when we look at um, a particular section of the dead sea scrolls called 4q mmt where the term ma'atse ha torah is used and it's being used to show that within that qumran community they had customs and traditions that you had to hear by in order to be part of their community. Otherwise, you could not, you'd be forbidden to be part of their community. You could not be a full fledged member. And they use that term, uh, Ma'atse Ha Torah, which comes from uh, the Hebrew there, meaning works of the law. All right. So that was a technical term, not necessarily referring to the law of Moshe, but it was their interpretation of the law of Moshe. And you must adhere by that 
in order to be part of their community. And within the Qumran community, they believed they were the true sons of light. So you had to be accepted into that community, come under their authority in order to be a true son of light, right? And then within the first century, there are different sects of Judaisms with different uh, requirements to be part of their community. And when you did, you came under their authority. And if their authority is not in step with the gospel or in line with the true uh, way of following the scriptures, then of course you are going to be misled and led astray. Now, the Greek term ergonamu is what we see here in Galatians, right? And it is that term works of law. Now, the uh, definite article the is not there, Okay, so it's just works of law. Now, Paul seems to show a pattern that when he does use that definite article, the, meaning the law, right? In the Greek there, ho, ho, namos, the law. He is speaking of the law of Moshe. But when that definite article, the, is not there, now you got to really look at the context closely because the term law can mean different things in different contexts. And in the book of Galatians, this term works of law is not referring to a general observance of the law of Moshe. It's referring to customs and traditions. And even when we go through the book of Galatians and you just see the term law there and not the um, definite article, the, within the Greek, it will be speaking of customs and traditions. Okay, When Paul is talking about the law of Moshe in the Greek, the Greek definite article, ho, the, will be used, ho, namos, the law. And that definitely will be speaking of the law of Moshe. So people need to really do their homework, really get this, because your English Bibles won't express this. It won't put the term the in italics when it's not there in the Greek. All right. Many of your translations won't do that. So, yes, go ahead and read this article. It is a solid argument for the term works of the law, meaning something other than a general observance of the law of Moshe. All right. Another article that you might want to read has to do with here. And again, I'll leave the link in the description box. And uh, this one is from the Center for Online Judaic Studies. And it does talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls here, the Mixat Ma'atzeh HaTorah in 4QMMT. And it does go on to talk about how this term was a term used within that sect of Judaism, the Qumran community as an expression that meant some of the precepts of the Torah, right? These are these were some of their customs and community laws that they believe you needed to abide by in order to be part of their community. In order to follow the law of Moshe correctly, you must buy, abide by these precepts of the Torah, right? Ma'atse ha-Torah or ergon namu, works of law. So we can see that this term was a technical term used uh, in the first century era, uh, meaning something other than a general observance of the law of Moshe. All right. It had to do with community laws. And what I like to uh, relate this to is, hey, if I'm Baptist, if I'm a Baptist, I can't call myself a Baptist if I'm not adhering to their doctrines. If I'm not adhering, that is telling you what community laws I go by, what doctrines I adhere to. And if I'm going to be a member of the Baptist community, there are certain things and ways I must interpret the Bible in order to be considered that uh, term for me, right? And we have, you know, Catholics, Lutherans, Pentecostals, these all show doctrinal uh, statements if you are adhering to those denominations. Very closely related to what we're seeing here in the first century when we're talking about Judaisms, okay? Certain sects, certain um, groups forced you to do certain things to be part of their community. And in their eyes, you were keeping the law of Moshe, but in Yeshua's eyes and in the eyes of Paul and others, you were violating the gospel message. It's not keeping the law of Moshe correctly. It's a perversion of the law of Moshe that's being done. It's not rightfully doing the law of Moshe, but it's perverting it. Okay, very important. So I will definitely leave this article also in the description box for you to read. All right, so also last week uh, we read 
I should say, Mr. Solberg uh, read Galatians 2.14, and this is um, where we also get that term udiazine, all right, udiazine, which has to do with Judaizing, okay? And so we get this term Judaizing here in uh, Galatians 2.14, and, you know, I guess what, maybe he didn't did he read? Yeah, I think he did read 214 last week. We did. We didn't really touch on it that much because we were focusing in on that term works of the law. But when he was confronting Peter and he was saying, hey, you know, basically here, if you a Jew being like a Gentile and not like a Jew, right? Udiazos here, uh, Udiazos has to do with living like a Jew, right? And I kind of explained that a little bit last week. You who are a Jew, if you live like a Gentile and not live like a Jew, which back then that had to do with the traditions and customs. That wasn't just, hey, we're living the law of Moshe. No, this has to do with the doctrines of men here, right? You were being, you were telling the Gentiles they didn't have to follow those doctrines of men by eating with them, by the fact you were eating with these uncircumcised Gentiles said you weren't adhering to those doctrines of men. But now since you drew back, now you're showing hypocrisy saying, oh, now I can't eat you because you're not following my doctrines of men. You haven't converted to becoming a Jew through this proselytized system. Okay, it had nothing to do with what was on the table. And so that's where we get this here, where it says uh, you were living like a Gentile, not like a Jew. Then why uh, do you compel the Gentiles to what live like Jews? In other words, Judaize, all right, Judaizing, Judaizing is living like a Jew, but that is according to their customs and traditions. Judaizing back then meant that you would follow their authority. Amen. And this is the pushback that Yeshua gave to the Pharisees. Their form of Judaism wasn't in line with the law of Moshe or the covenant. It perverted the covenant. That's why he told them in John 7, 19, you're not even following the law of Moshe. So this is the Judaizing, this is the Judaism that Paul is pushing back on because it isn't in step with the law of Moshe. It isn't in step with the gospel. Because again, faith in Yahweh and keeping the law are not in contradiction to one another. Okay, When you have faith in Yahweh, you will keep the law because it's an expression of your faith. He has saved you by grace, he redeemed you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life, and now you do kingdom living. You keep the law, amen, according to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this term, udaizing, Judaizing, all right, is used only one time in the apostolic writings, but it also is used in the book of Esther, in the book of Esther. So let's go there real quickly. All right, so in Esther chapter 8, we'll start with verse 15. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a, gold, a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted out and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every providence and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the people of the country declared themselves Jews, all right? They, what? Judaized. They became Jews, right? They converted to becoming a Jew for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. They wanted to show that they were on the Jew's side. They did not want to show that they were enemies of the Jews. So they went so far as to convert. Now, this was for political reasons, not necessarily religious reasons. But as you can see by the definition of the word, you've got to understand the context. To Judaize here could be something political, but in the first century, it meant something religious, meaning converting to our religious standards, our customs and traditions. And so you became a Jew. And those customs and traditions perverted the law of Moshe. That's why Yeshua pushed back on them. When Yeshua, being a prophet of God, prophet of the Father, and yes, I believe in his deity, he came preaching repentance. Repentance meant come back to the covenant. 
come back to your covenant obligations, which meant keeping the law of Moshe. You're not in step with your covenant obligations. You're not walking by faith because faith and the law of Moshe do not contradict. This is something Solberg just doesn't get, doesn't understand from all the hours that I have watched him. He's not getting it. Okay. And so, yes, even here, it is becoming a Jew, becoming Jewish according to certain standards, according to certain traditions. Okay. All right. So here is also a good resource for you to get. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with everything in this book, but it does prove my point that within the first century, this term Udaizing or Udaizing has to do with Judaizing, meaning uh, adhering to customs and traditions of the Jews, okay, which that's when you have to study, do they violate the Torah or do they not? If they do, now you're now you're in the like the area of Galatians where those customs and traditions were against the gospel message. So you don't change the law of Moshe, you change the customs and traditions. And that's what Paul was doing. So this book here is called the beginning uh, of the beginnings of Jewishness. All right, boundaries, varieties, uncertainties, and then the, the author of the book is Shay J D Cohen. All right, Shay J D Cohen. All right, and so Mr. Cohen writes in his book. Now I have this on Kindle. I don't have the actual physical book in, in front of me, so it just says here uh, that I'm in 33 percent of the book. It's location two zero six nine of six. Four six five, Okay, and so on this particular page, Mr. Cohen writes, in Christian Greek, Judaizing uh, almost always has its cultural meaning to adopt the customs and manners of the Jews. But within this definitional framework, Christians invested the word with new meanings, new overtones, and a new specificity not previously attested. The specifically Christian meaning in the order of the first adaptation are to be Jewish or to become Jewish, to interpret the Old Testament literally, to deny the divinity of Christ. In addition, in one passage, Eudiazine combines the cultural meaning with the political, to give support to the Jews by adopting their customs and manners. Of course, there are many, there are several passages in which the exact meaning of the word is not clear. And in many numbers of passages, Eudiazine is used with several meanings simultaneously. But all in all, I think the fivefold distinction is useful. Okay, distinction number one, the adoption of the customs and manners of the Jews. Many Christian writers like Origen and Eusebius use Eudiazine as Paul did in the general sense to adopt the customs and manners of the Jews. Eudiazine and its forms appears in the works of John Christentum as at least 36 times. 33 of these references occur in Christentum's commentaries and homilies on Galatians, Romans, Acts, and First Timothy. And unless I am mistaken, in all of these references, the word has its general Pauline meaning. Okay, This has to do with customs and traditions converting to becoming a Jew, right, by the customs and traditions. This is a perversion of the law of Moshe. And so when you keep the law of Moshe, you are walking by faith when you keep it rightly, all right? It's impossible to please God without faith. And so when you have faith, now you've been commanded, just like they were at Sinai, to follow the law of Moshe. Faith comes first, and then through faith, you begin to walk in the commandments. And today in the Holy Spirit, we walk what? In the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So we're walking in obedience to the commandments. That's the law of Moshe by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you. He will convict you when you've broken the law of Moshe. It's up to you to repent and turn and come back. Okay. And so this is how we walk in the image of Yahweh. So I will have... Uh, links again to these sources for you in the description box. Also, I will have two videos by um, a scholar through Torah resources by the name of Rob Van Hoff, who goes also through the Dead Sea Scrolls there sharing on that term Ma'atse Torah and how that was a technical term, meaning works of law. And it had to do with customs and traditions of that particular group there in Qumran. 
Okay, so that will help support the idea of works of law is not pertaining to a general observance of the law of Moshe, but specific ways to keep the law of Moshe. All right, now let's go ahead. We're now ready to get into video number three of Mr. Soberg. So yeah, I had to do this 20 minute detour just to kind of express my viewpoint a little bit more and where it's coming from. And so, yes, Mr. Soberg is not walking in step with the argument that Paul has in Galatians. He is creating a straw man. He is creating an argument that Paul is not even giving in the book of Galatians. But this is very common amongst Western Christianity, which is why I'm doing this series. All right, guys, welcome to part three in our Galatians Bible study. Now, as you know, this ministry is all about defending the biblical roots of Christianity from false teachings like Torahism. So this is an... And actually what I'm trying to do is protect you from the false teachings of R.L. Sober. Apologetics Bible study. And we're approaching the book of Galatians with an eye for the theological themes that speak to the relationship between the Christian and the law of Moses. And today we're going to step into the Apostle Paul's classroom as he puts on a master class in biblical theology, starting in chapter 3. So let's do a quick recap of where we are. So Galatians is a passionate letter that Paul wrote to the churches that he had planted in Galatia that were, following, that were falling under the influence of false teachers. These were Judaizers who were teaching that Christians are required to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, which is something Paul refers to in chapter 1 as a false gospel. And again, see how slippery that is? See how that is not the true message? He was not against circumcision and keeping the law of Moses. He was against what that term circumcision meant in the first century, which is why he wasn't uh, having Gentiles be circumcised, because it had a specific meaning that perverted the gospel message. It meant you must convert to their type of Judaism to be saved. You must come under their authority, the heavy weight of their traditions of men, which Yeshua called them hypocrites for doing that. He commanded them to go to the synagogue and listen to them uh, minister the law of Moshe. But then he said they are hypocrites. In what way were they hypocrites in Matthew 23, 15? Because they didn't keep in line with what they preached or what was read in the synagogues. When they left and began to do their traditions of men, it noticed hypocrisy going on. Okay. And that's what really was happening to Peter, right? Peter was walking as a hypocrite because he once ate with the Gentiles who were uncircumcised, which meant, hey, I'm not following those traditions of men. You are equal in my eyes through your faith in Messiah Yeshua. But then when the Judaizer came, he pulled back. And it was because of those traditions he pulled back, right? Not because of the law of Moshe, but because of those traditions. So then he became a hypocrite. So being hypocritical had to do with traditions not the law of Moshe. Very important. And we discovered that the other apostles agreed with Paul because when they all met up in Jerusalem, they didn't require Titus, a Greek believer, to be circumcised. And then in chapter 2, Paul confronted Peter about the fact that he used to eat with the Gentiles until these false teachers showed up, and then Peter separated from the Gentiles. And Paul called him to the carpet on that because that sort of conduct was, quote, not in step with the truth of the gospel. And so Paul launches into what is essentially a sermon on how we're not justified by works of the law. And our last episode left off at the final verse of chapter 2, which is a sort of mic drop moment where Paul says, If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Well, okay. If righteousness is through law, Christ died for no purpose. In other words, circumcision identifying you as someone who proselytized to becoming a Jew, coming under their authority. Okay. Again, having faith and keeping the law, there is no contradiction. Otherwise, Yahweh would never have given you the law at the Sinai and commanded you to keep it. Because the only way you could keep it is by faith. 
Amen. Which again, included repentance. I will constantly remind you of that because people keep trying to say, well, no one can do the law. No one can do the law. Sure. If there's no means of repentance, you can't do the law because no one can walk sinlessly. But within the law of Moshe, there was the means of repenting and turning to Yahweh. And it was your faith that honored Yahweh. When you repented and turned and trusted that he would forgive you, that is why what he was pleased in. Okay, I know he wasn't pleased with the animal blood and offerings. That was just pointing you towards Messiah Yeshua, towards Christ. It really didn't cleanse you from your sins. Amen. But when you put your faith and trust in Yahweh and followed his commands, that was the faith that pleased Yahweh. That's why you were forgiven prior to Yeshua. You could be forgiven prior to Yeshua, and it was because of your faith, your trust in him, and why you were forgiven. Okay, so Mr. Sober continues to not understand the law of Moshe and the cultural understanding of certain terms in the first century. I guess it wasn't actually a mic drop moment because as we're about to see, Paul was just getting started on this sermon, which continues into chapter three. And that's where we'll pick up today. As you know, the chapters and verse numbers aren't part of the original writings. They were added later by Bible translators to help us keep things organized. So let's begin today by rereading the last verse of chapter 2 and then moving right into chapter 3. And for those of you following along at home, we're reading from the ESV. So Paul's in the middle of a lecture on how we're justified by faith and not by works of the law. And let's read through a chunk of text here and then go back and unpack it. So starting at chapter 2, verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Oh, f If righteousness were through law, then Christ died for no purpose. We're talking about the traditions, the customs, okay? Is the definite article the there in verse 21? So, the definite article, the, is not there. Galatians 2.21, okay? I do not set aside the grace of God. If, through law, righteousness, then Christ died for naught. So, if Christ, if you could earn righteousness, if you could be in right standing with Yahweh through your ethnicity, through converting to Judaism by the man-made traditions, then Christ died for nothing. Okay. This is not talking about the law of Moshe. Otherwise, Paul would have the law there. But of course, Mr. Solberg doesn't recognize the difference because he doesn't understand the cultural context. Okay. The term works of law has to do with what? Customs and traditions of the day of converting to becoming Jewish. Right. So this is the central focus of Paul's argument, because he's going to talk about by perfecting yourself through the flesh circumcision. Right. And circumcision has a technical term back then of converting to becoming Jewish, according to their traditions, coming under their authority, which is a perversion of the law. Moshe, again, I'm repeating a lot of this because it, it really just needs to be driven home because Solberg continues to create a straw man when it comes to Paul's arguments. Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Christ, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? Whoa, Paul is worked up. And here we see one of his favorite teaching devices in spades, the rhetorical question. So Paul's trying to get the believers in Galatia to snap out of a spell, right? To, to shake off these bewitching teachings. And he's continuing here with the contrast that he, that he introduced in the previous chapter between works of the law 
and faith in Jesus. We looked at that last time, and Paul's just going to keep beating the same drum here in chapter That's right, because works of the law specifically has to do with circumcision, the act of circumcision and what it meant in the first century. Okay, it had a perversion, uh, perverted uh, or twisted definition back then. It was not the same definition that was at Sinai or Abraham. Okay, the same definition at Sinai and Abraham, if they were being implemented correctly, this would never have even come about because there was never a time where Jews or Gentiles were forced to become circumcised in order to live amongst the Jews and to be covenant members. They were never forced to do that. They were supposed to be counted as equal. All throughout Israel's history, Gentiles lived permanently amongst them, even like in King David's day, all right, when he uh, sinned with Bathsheba and killed her husband. Her husband was a Gentile living amongst the Jews permanently. He even fought with the Jews. Amen. And so, yeah, he wasn't being forced circumcision to live amongst the Jews and be a part of the people of God. Okay. Did uh, Gentiles, uh, would they take on circumcision so that they could eat at Passover, eat the specific meat coming from the temple and to uh, do an offering at the temple? Sure, they could. But that didn't have that same meaning that it had in the first century. You couldn't be accepted in their community. They wouldn't eat with you unless you were circumcised according to their traditions. That's not what you see in the time of King David or Moses or even in the time of Abraham. So understanding the meaning of words in their cultural context of that era in which we are dealing with is key. Okay. So no, Mr. Soberg, again, he's going off the rails. Chapter three, he's really drawing out the differences between works of the law and human effort on one hand and faith in Jesus on the other. So let's take a closer look at this passage. So verse one, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, this letter was written roughly 20 years after Yeshua's crucifixion, and it's unlikely that any of these believers in Galatia actually witnessed that event. Now, remember, these are churches that Paul had planted much later and to whom he had taught the gospel, as he tells us in chapter 1. So here he's reminding them of that, saying, Look, I set before you the sacrifice of Jesus, and that needs to remain your focus. And then he asks a rhetorical question. Verse 2, let me, ask you, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so? Did you receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit by your circumcision or by faith? And circumcision meant customs and traditions of men. Look at Cornelius. Cornelius was uncircumcised. By faith, he received the Holy Spirit. Was Cornelius uh, looking at the law of Moshe and following the law of Moshe. Sure he was. All right. That's what God fears did. They went as far as they could as they did what they could, but they didn't convert, take that full conversion of those traditions of men and become circumcised. Okay. But was he considered a devout person in the eyes of Yahweh? Absolutely. Was he following the law of Moshe and what he knew? Absolutely. He was. That's why he was called a God-fearer in the Jewish community. He was someone who was learning the ways of Moshe, and he was walking by faith. So that's why he was accepted. It was his faith. Yahweh was accepting. Faith and the law of Moshe do not contradict one another. Walking in faith will lead you to keep the law of Moshe because those are holy, righteous, and good commandments. Those are divine commandments. They're not man-made commandments, right? They are divine commandments, and they show you how to love. So foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And there's that contrast again, law and faith. Paul's trying to bring their minds back to when they first came to faith. And he's asking them to remember, how did your new life in Christ begin? Did the, did the Holy Spirit fall on you because of your tireless efforts to eat kosher and keep the feasts and all the rest? 
No, that's not even what they were trying to do. Okay. If he's talking to uncircumcised Gentiles, right, they received the Holy Spirit by faith. They weren't even being accepted because they weren't according to the traditions. So no, again, Mr. Soberg is arguing an argument that Paul is not even arguing. No one is trying to earn their salvation by keeping the law. Okay. They had a perversion of the law ideology back then that caused them not to keep the law of Moshe. And that is what was perverting the gospel. Or was it because you responded in faith to the preaching of the gospel? And Paul's answer, of course, is that they received the Spirit, that they came to salvation through their faith. And the phrase, are you so foolish, would have stung here. Paul's challenging their intelligence. He's saying, how could you possibly think that what God began in you through his Holy Spirit, that you can somehow maintain that on your own? This is exactly what some Hebrew roots teachers say today. They say, sure, salvation doesn't come through the law, but once we're saved, keeping the law is how we maintain our salvation. <laughs> Another straw man. That's a misrepresentation, at least of my position. I don't know how everyone does it. Remember, you can't just do a blanket statement over uh, people who are Torah pursuant. Okay. And so it wasn't in contradiction at Sinai. Faith and keeping the law is not in contradiction. Otherwise, Yahweh would have never gave the law. So I have faith in Yeshua. And so now I've come into a covenant with Yeshua. I have covenant obligations. I must walk in the law because it teaches me what sin is. And it shows me how to walk in the image of Yahweh. And when I sin, I need to repent. That's part of the law. That's the Holy Spirit's going to convict me when I break the law, which is breaking the law of Moshe. And if I'm sensitive to the Holy Spirit, I will turn and come back. If I'm resistant of the Holy Spirit, I will be stubborn and keep going in my rebellion. And it's up to the Holy Spirit, it's up to the Father, it's up to Yeshua to decide when I've gone too far and I've lost my salvation. You can become so rebellious in your stance that you drift away from your salvation and now it's all about you and it's not about Yeshua. It's not about his grace. It's not about his mercy because you are denying it through your actions. You are walking according to your flesh and not according to the ways of Yeshua which are shown through the law of Moshe. That's how he taught you how to live. It was a light yoke. Okay? So, yes, you can lose your salvation. It's not maintaining your salvation like that. Yeshua decides whether or not you are saved or not. It's in his hands. You trust in him. And how is that expressed? Through your obedience of walking in the law. The righteous shall live by emunah, by faith. You don't walk by faith and reject the law. Sorry, the two go hand in hand. You can't walk by faith and reject the law. That's not faith. Oh, foolish Torahists. Now, there are a couple of important theological ideas to notice here in verses 2 and 3. First, you should know that Paul mentions the Holy Spirit 18 times in this letter. It plays a crucial role in his defense of the gospel through the grace of God. And he'll write later in many of his other epistles, like Romans, about how the presence of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life is evidence of a true conversion. There's no salvation without the work of the Holy Spirit. And Paul directly links the presence of the Holy Spirit with a genuine faith in Jesus. And that's what he's reminding the believers in Galatia of here. And I think it's important for us to just be aware of these kind of word groups that Paul's using as he draws out this contrast. On one side, Paul refers to the works of the law, works of the flesh, or sometimes just the flesh, meaning our human physical efforts. And on the other side, we have faith and the spirit. So this contrast that, that Paul's highlighting also has an aspect of natural versus supernatural. Which brings us to the second theological idea I want to point out here in verse 3. It's this phrase, perfected by the flesh. So, so Paul uses three Greek terms in this argument to refer to the same general concept. There's DKO, which means justified. And then there's a closely related word is DKO Sunni, which means righteousness. 
And then there's epitaleo, which means completed or finished, or as the ESV renders it, perfected. So in our English translations, these are the words justified, righteousness, and perfected. And these are all closely related in the argument that Paul's putting together here. They all refer to the idea of being declared righteous or being right in the, in the eyes of God. So here in verse 3, when Paul asks, Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? He's saying, are you now trying to complete your righteousness by your own works? Your, your physical efforts at keeping the law? Not at all. By your identity of becoming a Jew, that's what he's saying. You're trying to perfect your flesh by identifying yourself as Jewish. If I identify myself as Jewish, being a Jew, I am now righteous because now I am adhering to the customs and traditions that these authority figures have told me to do. This is how I become righteous. This is why Yeshua said your righteousness must supersede that of the perishim. Their righteousness depended on what? Their glory, their traditions, their customs is where they, they uh, sought their righteousness from. It wasn't found in the righteousness of the law. Otherwise, they would be keeping the law correctly, and their customs and traditions would line up with the law. It's not that customs and traditions are bad, right? But they are bad when they don't line up with the law. And that was the problem. And that's what Yeshua was correcting for three and a half years. Their interpretation of the law was incorrect, not the law itself. So unless your righteousness surpasses that of the perishim, of the Pharisees, that means their interpretation of keeping the law was false. It was not in line with the gospel. It was not in line with the words of Yeshua. But if you go to Deuteronomy 6, 24 through 25, it is righteousness for you who keep this law. That is Yeshua right there, walking sinlessly, keeping the law. It is righteousness for him. Right, He walked sinlessly in that. So the righteousness that we have in Messiah Yeshua is he delivered us. He redeemed us. That's the righteousness of Yeshua, the righteousness of God. Now we need to walk in righteousness, and that righteousness is found in the law. But that comes after you've been redeemed by faith in Yeshua. And now you're being obedient to your king. And you're walking in the righteousness of the law, which is walking in holiness. Walking in holiness is walking in the righteousness of the law. It's what we are commanded to do after we have been redeemed. And then he asks another question, which is a little more obscure and maybe personal. Verse 4. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So Paul and his readers would have understood what things he was referring to, but it's a little ambiguous for us today. I mean, he could be talking about a painful learning process or maybe the difficult spiritual experiences. Maybe that's what they suffered or, or maybe it's some sort of social ostracism that they were experiencing because of their faith in Jesus. And then the questions just keep coming. Verse five, does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith. So who is Paul talking about here? Who supplies the spirit to the believers in Galatia? And by whose power are miracles being done? He's talking about God, of course. And he's asking, does God do these things? D does he pour out his spirit and work miracles because of your works of the law or because of your faith? Right. Is he pouring out miracles just because you're a Jew, because you're Jewish, or is he pouring out miracles because of your faith in him? Right. It's not about your obedience to the law of Moshe. It's about uh, your, uh, you're trying to what? Say that miracles are poured out because I'm Jewish. Is that, I mean, Paul's like, hey, does he supply the spirit to you and works a miracle among you by doing works of law, by you becoming Jewish? Right, traditions of men taking on physical circumcision, coming Jewish, or by hearing with faith. He delivered Israel by faith and then gave them the law. It's another rhetorical question with an obvious answer that Paul then ties to Abraham in the next verse. So, verses five and six, which are one thought Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you 
In other words, does God do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And this is Paul's first mention of Abraham, the father of the faith in this epistle. And he's pointing out that Abraham was counted as righteous based on his faith, not his works. In fact, as Paul's going to point out a little later in this chapter, the law wasn't even given until more than 400 years after Abraham lived. So Abraham never kept a single law of Moses, and yet God counted him as righteous. He never kept a single law of Moses. The law of Moses teaches you how to love your neighbor as yourself and how to love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So I definitely think we can look in the law of Moses and see that he was keeping some of those laws. Now, was he keeping all of those laws? I don't think so, because they were given to a nation, not a clan or a specific family, but a nation so that they could be governed. God was creating a kingdom out of this nation. So, but did Abraham, when it says that he believed God and was counted him righteous, did he have trust in Yahweh? Yes. Would that have been expressed by keeping his commands? Well, sure. Genesis 26, verse 5, that he kept what? His ordinances, uh, his instructions, his Torah oath. So, yes, Abraham trusted Yahweh. Okay, Yahweh created the means by which Abraham could come in relationship with him. Abraham trusted that. He trusted the covenant, and that was expressed through his obedience. His obedience showed his faith, okay? So the two went hand in hand. Abraham was not walking around disobeying Yahweh, and, and even when he did disobey Yahweh, it's not like, oh, I'm not going to repent. I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm just going to be rebellious. No, Abraham would have repented and turned and kept going. His trust remained. It was a trusting that remained in Yahweh. Okay. And with that, Paul's now going to take his readers on a fascinating historical and theological journey, grounding his argument about works versus faith in the Torah itself. So to make sure we're tracking with Paul's argument here, let's flip back to the book of Genesis, chapter 15. And this is where God made his covenant with Abraham. And Paul's going to refer to this a number of times in the coming verses in Galatians. So let's refresh ourselves on what it says. And remember, in their very old age, the Lord had promised Abraham and Sarah a son. But they grew impatient waiting on God, so they just took matters into their own hands. And Abraham ended up having a son, Ishmael, through his servant Hagar, rather than his elderly wife, Sarah. And Genesis 15 is where God tells Abraham that even though he was his firstborn son, Ishmael wouldn't be his heir, that Abraham would have a natural son. And then verse 5, And God brought Abraham outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So God made a promise to Abraham that his offspring would be like the number of stars in the sky at night. But those offspring wouldn't come through Ishmael, who was, and here's the key, who was a product of the work of Abraham's flesh. Abraham took matters into his own hands. and Right. So he was disobeying God. Salvation can not come when you are disobeying the instructions of Yahweh. When you disobey the instructions of Yahweh, salvation can't come. That is what they're doing in Galatians. They're disobeying the law. They're disobeying the law of Moshe through their traditions, by their own means, by their own works. That's why we're saying that, and that's what's connected to circumcision. That's why it's a work of the flesh. The interpretation of what circumcision meant in the days of Paul had become twisted, had become perverted. It wasn't what it meant in the days of Abraham and Moshe. Abraham was given circumcision as a sign of the covenant. It wasn't, hey, I'm saved by this, right? It was because he already had faith, and it was a sign of the promises that Yahweh gave to him. So that's how we have to understand it. Abraham disobeyed the instructions of Yahweh, went into Hagar, produced Ishmael, Obedi or salvation cannot come through a perversion of the instructions. 
by man taking on his own ways. And that's what was happening in the book of Galatians. They were creating their own means. They were twisting the law of Moshe and creating their own means of salvation through human traditions, through man-made traditions. God said, no, Abraham's true heir is going to come through the son that God had promised to give him. And as you know, Sarah ultimately gave birth to that promised son when she was 91 years old, and they named him Isaac. So there's a son of the flesh, the works, right? Abraham had Ishmael as a result of his own will and physical efforts. And then there's a son of the promise, a son that came through God's promise, through God's will. And in Genesis 12, 3, God promises Abraham that in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So not just his own family or his own descendants, but all families will be blessed through Abraham. And when you read the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, you see that Jesus descended from Abraham through the promised son Isaac. So Jesus is the blessing that came through Abraham and is for all the families of the earth. Okay, so keep in mind these promises to Abraham. So, so let's jump back to Galatians 3. Now, Paul tells the Galatians that God has supplied the Spirit to you and works miracles among you because of your faith. And then verse 6, Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So now we can see Paul's allusion to Abraham's two sons in the text. Ishmael, who was the result of, of Abraham's work in the flesh, and Isaac, who was a, a result of Abraham's faith. And it's those of faith, not works, who God considers the sons or the descendants of Abraham. And again, it was Abraham's son by faith, Isaac, through whom Jesus came. So Paul's tying Abraham's faith directly to faith in Jesus. And he does so explicitly in the next verse, verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And that's why at Sinai, God accepted both the Gentile and the Israelite who came there by faith. It was to show that circumcision does not save you. Okay, circumcision, according to any type of tradition, does not save you. No, they were saved by the redempted work of Yahweh, and they were brought to Sinai, and both were accepted equally. That is the gospel message. That is the preaching. That is the same message about Yeshua, his work. I believe Yeshua was the arm of the Lord. He was the messenger of Yahweh who delivered them out of Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai and walk with them 40 years in the desert. So it is by faith that you are saved and you are brought into the covenant. And when you take on the covenant, you have responsibilities. But if you start perverting those instructions that were given at Sinai and 40 years in the desert, those divine commandments, if you start perverting them and creating your own way, then yes, you will fall away from grace because of your traditions. This is so amazing. I love this. Paul connects Abraham and his faith to Jesus so completely that he actually says that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Wow. This brings to mind the words of Jesus. In That's because it's the good news about God and his redemptive work. God was redeeming people all throughout history. Yeshua is the greatest act of redemption. Nobody can surpass it. Nobody can do greater than what Yeshua did. He is the means and way of salvation into eternal life. Okay, full purifying, purification of your sins, purifying you from all of your sins. And of course, you receive that when you receive your new body, all right, when you become born again. In uh, uh, John eight fifty six, where he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So, so Paul's drawing this connecting line of faith, starting at Abraham and extending all the way down through the centuries to Jesus, 
and then by extension, to everyone who places their faith in Jesus. Verse 9, So then those who are of faith in Jesus are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, that in him all the families of the earth will be blessed. Right? The families of the earth weren't blessed through Ishmael, the son of works. God's promise to Abraham was fulfilled through Isaac, the son of faith, which is why Jesus says in John 4 that salvation is from the Jews. So if you're a Christian today and you place your faith in Jesus, then you are an, you're an inheritor, a living heir of the promise that Yahweh made to Abraham 4,000 years ago. Wow. Okay, with the foundation of that connection to Abraham established, Paul's going to start connecting some other dots and, and stringing some pearls together as his argument unfolds here. So again, he's just established that those who live by faith are blessed along with Abraham who lived by faith. And then here comes the contrast to that verse. Verse 10, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So unlike those who live by faith, those who try to live by their own effort to make themselves righteous through works of the law or works of the flesh are cursed. This is a false interpretation. Okay. For all who rely on works of the law, meaning that I must become saved through what? The traditions of men. This sign of circumcision shows that I am coming under the authority of these traditions, that I am converting to becoming a Jew, becoming Jewish through their traditions. I come under a curse. Why? Because it violates the book of the law. All right. And so then a curse comes on me because curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Walking in the book of the law also meant walking in repentance. It was not too difficult for you. Okay, let's go ahead and go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. So in the Deuteronomy 30, starting with verse 11, Moshe says, For this commandment that I command you today to keep the book of the law, to keep the laws of Yahweh, is not too hard for you, neither is it too far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart so that you can do it. What is that word that is in your heart? It is faith. You can do this by faith. That's the only way you can do the book of the law. You do the book of the law by faith, and it includes repentance. That's still walking in faith. So yes, cursed everyone who does not abide by all that is written in the book of the law, right? So what we can do today, we should be doing. And if we just walk in rebelliousness and not walk in repentance, we will be under a curse. But those of us who put our faith and trust in Yeshua and begin walking in the book of the law, when we break it, we will repent. We will not walk under a curse that way, All right? Just like in the days of Moshe, if you repented and turned from your ways like all the prophets called Israel to do, they would walk in righteousness. It would be righteousness for them. Amen? So no, the book of the law was not too hard. The curse comes when you follow the works of law. And you depend on that, which is man-made traditions of converting to becoming a Jew. And the sign of that was circumcision. Now you're under a curse because it violates the book of the law. Backs that up with a quote from the Torah. He's citing Deuteronomy 27, 26 here to show that everyone who relies on works of the law is under the curse of the law. And he's showing his readers that this isn't a new idea. It comes from the Torah itself. And he's contrasting that with the blessing of Abraham that's given to all who trust God, including Gentiles. As he mentioned specifically in verse 8, in other words, contrary to what the Judaizers were teaching, the law can't justify or save anyone. Why? Because the
the law does justify you. Romans chapter 2, it is not the hearers of the law that are justified, but it is the doers of the law that just are justified. Why? Because the just shall live by amuna, by faith. Habakkuk 2, 4. You live by faith. What? How is that expressed? By keeping the law. Right? So again, he's got the whole definition of works of the law messed up, which is why he keeps contradicting himself, or I should say contradicting scripture. Okay? He thinks he is speaking things fluently and in line, but he's contradicting scripture and the words of Paul and what Paul meant. He's creating a straw man argument. So he's not even creating an argument that Torah pursuant people like myself are doing. That's not how we live. We are not living in any way the way Solberg thinks we are living. Breaking of any command of the law brought a curse on the person who broke it. So Deuteronomy 11 says, verse 26, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. So notice it's a complete rebelliousness. It's a turning aside. When does the curse come? When you totally abandon your covenant. But if you are walking in obedience to the commandments of Yahweh, that includes repenting when you sin, you're still under a blessing. It's when you don't repent, when you break a command, that you come under this curse. Because it's showing that you're going after self and you're walking no different than the nations. So notice the difference here. Get the context. This Bible professor here, Mr. Solberg, is not understanding the context. So the commandments this verse is talking about are the law that God gave to Israel through Moses. It's what Scripture calls the law of Moses. And the law of Moses served as the terms of the, of the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. And that covenant came with blessings and curses, which are, which are spelled out in detail in Deuteronomy 28. So Paul's reminding the Galatians about what the Torah says, that those who... See how the purpose of the Torah was not just curses, was not just uh, to tell you that you can't do it and all of those other things that Western Christianity... No, there's blessings under the law of Moses too, when you walk in it, which means walking in repentance, okay? So we, we, it's both walking in the law can be a blessing or a curse. But when you're walking in the law, according to the spirit, you will be blessed. It will be righteousness for you. You will receive blessings from walking in obedience. Okay. This is not the righteousness of God, according to Yeshua. That's the righteousness of Yeshua is his work. We received that when we put our faith and trust in him. Now we're called to walk in righteousness. Okay. Holiness, separation from the world. You find that in walking in the instructions of Yahweh, which are in the law of Moshe. Who live under the law had a literal curse hanging over their heads. Yahweh set before them a blessing, of course, but also a curse if they didn't obey. So they were always aware that if they didn't keep the commandments, there were curses that would follow. And the Old Testament records Israel's continuous inability to keep that law, to, to keep that covenant. In fact, but that was their choice. It wasn't that it was impossible. It's not impossible, right? There were people who walked in righteousness, who kept the law, who, and it was only done by faith. Okay? But that was their choice to not obey it. They could have obeyed it, but they chose not to. In fact, it was because Israel continually broke the covenant, they just could not keep the law, that Yahweh decided in his mercy to make a new covenant with his people. So 600 years before Jesus, the prophet Jeremiah wrote, Behold, the day... It wasn't just because the Israelites were constantly breaking it that he made a new covenant. He's known all along that the covenant made at Sinai could not give eternal life. Okay, this is the progress of progressive revelation of showing you who Yahweh is. 
amen, and how he's bringing about redemption to the whole world. So there was nothing wrong with the law of Moshe. That's why we still have to keep it today. But what were we missing? All right, the de redemptive work of Yeshua gives us eternal life and cleanses us in a permanent way from our unrighteousness. Because when we receive that new glorified body, we will what? We will be cleansed, okay, from all of our unrighteousness. That is the point of the resurrection. That is the work of Yeshua that cannot come about through the blood of animals, bulls, and goats, okay? And it is our faith in Yeshua, amen, that he looks for. Your faith in me, and then I accept it. It's my way of, I have to accept it. Just because I say I have faith in Yeshua, that doesn't force Yeshua to accept it. He looks into my heart. He knows. He makes the final decision on whether to accept or not, whether I am walking in faith or not. His final, he is the judge. His final decision. Days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And catch this, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. They broke it by their choice. Not that they had to or couldn't, okay? They broke it by their choice. And notice that the new covenant is made with Israel, not something called the church. It's made with Israel. They are still Yahweh's firstborn son. They will always be Yahweh's firstborn son. So believers in Yeshua are within Israel, not outside of Israel. It's not something called the church. That word church is being used anachronistically. The word ecclesia just means what? Assembly, congregation, people of God, right? And so the word church came about much, much later. It comes from the Greek word kuriakon, okay? And it comes out of replacement theology. That's why that word uh, has a twist to it. And that's what Mr. Soberg still doesn't understand either. So that's why his theology continues to be off base from Scripture. So God is the faithful husband, and Israel was an unfaithful bride. And guess what? Christians today are no better than Israel. No one can keep the law perfectly. We're all cursed. As Paul says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, here in Galatians, Paul is showing how all... And we are all under the curse of Adam. We all will die, right? The curse has to do with death. We are all under the curse of death. But could people be forgiven prior to Yeshua? Absolutely, they could. Could they escape the curse of death? No, they could not. Okay, so Yeshua purifies us from our unrighteousness in a permanent state. Amen. And he reverses the sin of Adam, the curse of death that resides over all of us. All who rely on works of the law are under a curse. And he continues, verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. So there again is Paul's common refrain in this book. No one is justified by law, not the law, because you are justified by the law. Okay? When I obey the laws of my country in America, am I justified? Absolutely, I'm justified because I'm obeying them. So yes, I can obey the law of Moshe and be justified, but I'm already saved. I'm already in the kingdom. This is talking about walking in holiness. This is talking about keeping to my covenant. That is the righteousness that is being said about Deuteronomy, 20, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 24 and 25. It is righteousness for you because you were walking in holiness. The righteousness of God is Messiah Yeshua, but our righteousness walking in the law is what we are supposed to do. You receive the righteousness of Yeshua for salvation, and then you walk in righteousness according to the law because that's part of your covenant relationship. So this term here, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by law, not the law, but by law. For the righteous, the just shall live by Amonah. How do you live by Amonah? Keeping the commandments. That's how it's expressed. 
no one is justified before God by the law. And he quotes from Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by faith, which of course also brings to mind Genesis 15, which we just looked at, where Abraham's faith made him righteous. And the subtext here is that, hey, these aren't new ideas, guys. This is all stuff that comes from our own Hebrew scriptures. And Paul is really going to draw out that distinction between... It's nothing new, which tells you it never was that way, right? But that doesn't mean you didn't keep the law of Moshe. It just means that in the first century, there was a twisting, a perverting of how to walk in the law of Moshe, right? So there's nothing new. It's all supposed to be done according to the ways of Yeshua, according to the ways he's been given it all along. He gave it to Abraham. He gave it to Sinai when the prophets were calling them to come back and repent, okay, to turn for their unrighteousness and walk in righteousness. It's all still supposed to be the same. That same faith. Now you have faith in Yeshua. Amen. And you're still walking that same faith out the same way that they did prior to Yeshua is how you're supposed to walk it out with Yeshua. Faith and law. Verse 12. But the law is not of faith. Wow. Don't miss that. The law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Okay. Let's look at it much closer. All right, so as we see here in the Greek, the definite article, the, is there. So it is talking about the law of Moshe. So, and the law is not of faith. Rather, the one having done these things will live by them, okay? It is an expression of your faith. This is Leviticus 18.5, okay? The one that having done these shall live by them, Okay. Faith comes from what? Your faith and trust in Yahweh. It comes from inside of you, that you put your faith and trust, and then it is expressed, right? Faith, the law comes after you have received faith, after you have put your faith and trust, and after you've decided to follow Yeshua. Okay? So this is why, again, it's important to look at it in the Greek to see if that definite article, the, is there. It is there, okay? So, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Of course, it is an expression of your faith. Look at the example that we get. Faith came first, okay? The work of Yahweh delivered Israel out of Egypt. They had to get to Sinai by faith. And then they were given the commandments, amen, to learn how to walk in them. It's an expression of your faith. If you have faith, then you will live by them, right? The one who does them shall live by them. These are divine commandments. They show you how to love Yahweh and love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 18.5, to draw a stark contrast, the law is not of faith. They aren't the same thing. Why? Well, because the law is based on doing. Leviticus says that the one who does these commandments shall live by them. But faith, on the other hand, is based on believing and trusting. Now, sometimes Hebrew roots teachers will try to take this nuanced approach and claim, hey, it takes faith to obey the law. So they'll conclude that faith is obedience to the law. <laughs> but Paul believes Faith is an expression, right? When you express your faith, you keep the law. You're not just going to trust God and do nothing, right? That's not what Yeshua taught. That's not what any of the prophets taught. Living by faith, the just shall live by faith, will mean they will follow the law. They will, they will walk in it because that is part of your covenant relationship. Even, uh, even Western Christians today Though you have faith, does that mean you get to walk around, keep on sinning, as Paul says? No, nobody believes that. Nobody believes that because you have faith now, you now have an excuse. Well, I should say we have free gracers. We have that hyper grace. That's where that comes from, that, yes, you can freely pre basically sin, and it's no problem because you're still saved. But no, that's not what Paul taught. If you have faith, you will walk in obedience. Walk in obedience to what? Obedience to the law. 
what law is that? That's why Paul says in Romans 3, does our faith nullify what? The law? No, it does not nullify law, right? The whole meaning of circumcision doesn't nullify that. Our faith does not nullify that, that the promises were going to come, that we need to walk in covenant faithfulness and so forth. No, your faith does not nullify the promises of Yahweh, right? Blows that idea out of the water here. He quotes Leviticus to show that God requires the doing of the law, not merely believing in it. And therein lies the rub. Since no one can keep or do the law perfectly, we're all cursed. And for our Hebrew... There's that twist again, twisting the truth, right? People were righteous before. They were walking, but you walked in repentance. Nobody is saying that you uh, have to keep the law sinlessly. You can't keep the law sinlessly, but the law is not made in that fashion. Okay, it shows you how to repent. It shows you to how to walk in righteousness. It shows you that you can't walk sinlessly. That's a positive thing, but it also shows you how to walk in repentance. That is still keeping the law. Hebrew Roots friends who tend to marginalize or even reject Paul and claim that his teachings clash with what Jesus taught. Think about this. How many times do we read about Jesus saying something like, your faith has made you well? We find that at least a dozen times in the Gospels, but we never hear him saying, your keeping of the law has made you well. For example, Matthew 9, when the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years touched the fringe of his garment, does Jesus turn around and say, take heart, daughter, your works have made you well? No, even though she worked pretty hard to get through the crowd and touch him, he said, your faith has made you well. Or in Luke 22, when, when and her faith was expressed by that work. That work was included, right? It was expression, but it came, her, it was showing the faith that was already there. It followed her faith, right? She had the faith even before she touched the garment. She went for it. She decided in her heart, yes, I'm going to go touch that garment. And then she did it, okay? She walked in obedience to that faith that was in her that he was the Messiah, he is the healer, and she went to him. And that's what we do. We go to Yeshua, right? And what will Yeshua tell us to do? Walk after me, pick up your cross and follow me. Did he follow the commandments? Absolutely. He walked in faith. When Jesus foretells Peter's denial, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that you do not fail in your works of the law. <laughs> no, that's not what it says. Jesus says, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus doesn't, doesn't tell us that if our works are the size of a mustard seed, we can move a mountain. <laughs> and he never says, oh, you of little works. <laughs> no, for Jesus, just like for Paul, it's all about faith. If you don't have faith, you won't have proper works. The works follow the faith. Okay, you get the point. So, continuing on here in Galatians 3, uh, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Wow. Wow. There's a lot packed into these two verses. So let's dig in. Remember, a curse of the law comes by violation. Works of the law is a perversion of the law of Moshe. You're perverting the law of Moshe, which is why you're violating it, which is why you're under a curse. So he's redeeming you from the curse. He's not redeeming you from the law of Moshe as if that's now destroyed. He's redeeming you from your violations of it. Because that's how it operated, right? Blessings and cursings. Okay. When you walked in it, it was blessing. When you didn't walk in it, it was cursing. And when you repented and turned and came back, that didn't destroy the law in your life. It was still there. You still had to obey it. But your violation of it, you were forgiven of your violation of it. And so Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
not what? The law itself. And what was the curse of the law? Death. What did he redeem you from? Death. He redeemed you from death, from the powers of darkness. The powers of darkness, what? Had the power of death. He redeemed you from that. Just like uh, at um, in the land of Egypt. Israel, I mean, uh, yeah, Israel was in the bondage of slavery to what? The world. Pharaoh represented the world system, all right? Represented death. And so, yes, they were redeemed out of Egypt from slavery. Yeshua redeems us from the curse of the law, death. A little here. First, would you look at that? It's yet another quote from the Torah. In the span of seven verses here, Paul has quoted from the Hebrew Bible six times. And in this case, he's quoting Deuteronomy 21, 23. And what's really interesting is that Paul seems to be using a Hebrew method of interpretation here called Midrash. Now, Midrash is an approach where you examine the text from all sides and, and derive interpretations from it that aren't immediately obvious. So you're looking for something beneath the primary meaning of the text. And then you, then you apply that deeper or other meaning to something else. So the original meaning in this passage from Deuteronomy 21 is that, hey, if a guy commits a capital crime, punishable by death, and you hang him on a tree, you can't leave his body there because, as it says in verse 23, a hanged man is cursed by God. But Paul takes this concept of a man hanging on a tree and applies it to the crucifixion of Jesus. And by doing that, he's making this profound point. He's showing his readers how... Under the law of Moses, it was the Israelites who were under a curse. Because again, if they didn't keep those commandments, they would break the covenant and suffer the curses that God set out. So in a very real sense, they were living under a curse. Right. Because of their traditions of men, they weren't keeping the law. It was impossible for them to keep the law because of the traditions they set up. That's why they were nullifying the word of God with their traditions. Okay, that's why they were under the curse. It wasn't that it was impossible for them to keep it. God did not set them up to fail. He did not set them up to just be a cursed people. That was their choice to disobey the law of Moshe. Okay, and then there were those who were righteous. All right, we have righteous people. Moshe was righteous. Daniel was righteous. You know, we've got Job and Noah. We've got all kinds of people. The prophets were righteous. Amen. They walked in righteousness. They kept the instructions of Yahweh and they repented when they sinned. And so Paul's talking about the fact that technically speaking, it was those who couldn't keep the law, which includes literally everybody. Those who could not keep the law are the ones who should have been placed on that cross. They should have suffered the curse of the law. But in a mind-blowing act of mercy... And we all still will die. The curse of the law is death. We're still going to die. What law are we talking about? Well, when you break God's law, you receive death. The wages of sin is death. That's the curse that we have been redeemed from. It is appointed once for man to die, then the judgment. So that is what Yeshua is redeeming us from. Not only the sin of Adam, but our sins that bring about death in our life. We cannot be purified. We must stand before Yahweh purified. And that is what the blood of Yeshua does. It purifies us from our unrighteousness. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. This is the idea that theologians have come to refer to as substitutionary or vicarious atonement. Paul is teaching that Jesus Christ took the full punishment that we deserve for our sins as a substitute in our place. Which is a false teaching. He did not die in your place. You're still going to die. You're still going to suffer, suffer the curse of the law. You are going to die. But what did Yeshua do? He suffered that curse so that he could redeem you from it. 
that action of Yeshua was pleasing to Yahweh, that he what gave him the power over death. Yeshua has the keys of death. And so he can now redeem you from the curse that is on you, that curse of the law. He was not your substitute. You will still die. Okay. What you cannot do is purify yourself. Okay. So he's going to redeem you from that curse and he's going to purify you through his blood, through that act of his blood. You will become pure, meaning you will receive a new body, a resurrected body that is not contaminated by sin, defiled by sin. All right, let's continue. That's the gospel right there. As my pastor Tony says, the gospel in four words, Jesus in my place. That's what it's all about. For Paul, the gospel is the central message that he's all. Jesus saved me from the power of death. Death still resides on me, but he's going to save me from it. And I can't do it myself. Only he can save me from it always hammering home. And so the profound point he's making is this. Under the law of Moses, the Israelites were under a curse and God was not. But Jesus reversed those roles. God willingly placed himself under a curse in order to free his people from their curse. All right, so from here, Paul is only gonna be wading into deeper waters. And so rather than continuing on, I want to take a moment to sort of recap all that Paul's been teaching us since the, the middle of chapter two, because there are some important themes and patterns here that we need to notice that are going to help us as we continue to work our way through the, the rest of this book. Now, hopefully by now you're getting the message that Paul's practically shouting to his readers. I mean, how many times in the last few verses has he talked about the law not making us right with God? I mean, going all the way back to chapter false again, what he's shouting is your traditions, your customs cannot make you right with God. You have a perverted meaning of the law of Moshe. You have a perversion of how the idea of salvation works. Chapter two, this has been Paul's repeated message over and over. So check it out. Chapter 2, verse 16, a person is not justified by works of the law, not by works of the law. By works of the law, no one will be justified. <laughs> and that's just verse 16. Uh, and then in verse 21, if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And then in chapter 3, verse 2, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Verse 3, are you now being perfected by the flesh? By which he means the, the doing of the law. Uh, verse 5, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the, the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Uh, verse so again, you see how he's twisting the meaning of Paul. Twisting it to mean something that doesn't mean he's created a straw man. It is by their customs and traditions. They're trying to be perfected by man's traditions, by man's means of receiving salvation, not by God's means. Okay? God's means is put your faith and trust in Yeshua. Now filled with the Holy Spirit, keep the law of Moshe because it is holy living. Works of law has to do with identifying as a Jew, being converted, proselytized system of converting to becoming a Jew. Um, I think we've uh, got enough here uh, to understand the difference of what I'm trying to share versus what Mr. Solberg is trying to share. We're going to continue in the next video next time together. Uh, but it is plainly simple to me that Mr. Solberg has created a straw man argument on Paul's letters. And again, the reason why I am going through his series, it's very common. Okay, Within Western Christianity, the misunderstanding of Paul's letters is very common. And yes, Paul's letters are what? Scripture. In my eyes, they are Scripture. I believe in the deity of Yeshua. It's just that people do not understand Paul's letters very well. Uh, many within the Torah pursuant communities do understand, and some don't, right? Western Christianity, many of them do not understand Paul's letters correctly, okay? 
So yes, but you be the judge, you study to show yourself approved. Again, I'll leave uh, the links of my sources in the description box to, to help you. I hope you've enjoyed our time together. It's not over. We've got video number four coming up next. And please hit that subscribe button there. Uh, pass the video around if you feel it will help others. And uh, yeah, go to Spotify. I'm on Spotify also with Keys of the Kingdom there. If uh, YouTube is not uh, a platform for you. All right. Blessings, everyone. And shalom. Till next time.